<laughs> Phil joins us via telephone from Ameriprise Financial and the Marius Group of Financial Advisors, Winchester Avenue, Martinsburg. Good morning, Philly. Good morning, guys. How are you all? Splendid, Philip. It's uh, kind of you to ask. <laughs> Thank you, sir. You're quite welcome. Uh, so, Phil, we were on a roll there for the first quarter of the year, and then uh, last week, prior to Friday at least, we kind of hit the brakes. What's making us so uneasy out there? Hit, hit a bit of a speed bump, and, and you would have thought the information that we got on Friday would have made that even worse, but it didn't. And what we found out on Friday is that our uh, employment numbers were a little bit stronger than what was expected, and that's an inflationary pressure. However, our markets went green anyway. So as we look at this first quarter, there's a lot of narratives that underlie it. We have sticky inflation. We we had expected it would be a little bit lower than what it has been. We'll get more information this week as the CPI numbers come out. Bond yields have returned back to October highs, October, early November highs. The economy uh, remains strong simply because of the consumer remains strong and willing to spend and employment numbers are stronger than what we would have expected. The Federal Reserve rate cuts, because of all that information, has the expectations of how many rate cuts have decreased. If you remember, back in December, we expected six rate cuts in 2024. Now it's down to three, and some are even suggested that there won't be any. And when those rate cuts will happen, have been extended, back in December, we thought it was going to be March, and of course that didn't happen in March. So we moved that goalpost out to June or July, and now it looks like that may not be possible either based off of all those other things that we had just talked about. And the only thing that we can look at to say, hey, what has made our market so far this year? Now, last week was a speed bump, make no mistake about it, but we expect that when things have gone as well as they have in the fourth quarter of last year and the first quarter of this year, not, not too big of a shock that we've hit a little bit of a speed bump. But the on the other side of the equation is uh, strong corporate earnings, which this week kicks off another round of corporate earnings, and a pop in artificial intelligence, essentially supported by NVIDIA. And all of that underlying narrative, if you would have told me that, and this is why we don't try to predict the market, if you would have told me this is what's going to happen, this is what these reports are going to read for us in the first quarter, in the first week, of, uh, tw- in, in, of the second quarter in 2024, what do you think would happen to the markets? And I was like, oh, boy, it's going to be an, it's going to be an ugly start. Uh, I suppose it's going to be an ugly start, and it hasn't been. Even with last week, it has still been a really good start to the year. And it goes back to something that John always says, and we try to keep in the back of our mind, is we get a lot of noise. There's a lot of economic noise. There's a lot of political noise. Uh, there's a lot of report noise in that alphabet soup of inflation reports, and, and I'm still not from Bill to give full credit to Bill for that, but the 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 corporate earnings have been strong enough to re- support our markets having a good first quarter so far this year. So there's a lot of reshaping of information and expectations, but those still ex- the expectations are still there that there won't be any more rate increases. And you've heard a couple people mutter it, and it's scary, but there won't be any more rate increases. And dare I say, can we keep our markets keep doing well or hold on at least to what we've gotten so far this year, even if there's not any rate cuts? Because we have to think, you know, what would cause us not to cut rates? Well, on one hand, it would be inflation hasn't made significant advances down to that target. But on the other hand, which is good news, is our economy, by, they, by how they measured anyway, has remained strong and a resilient consumer. Now, what I mean by resilient consumers, we're all complaining about prices. We have been for quite some time, but by and large, as a society, it hasn't stopped us yet. Phil, the uh, interest rates being as what they are, uh, savings account where I bank pays 4.35%, no strings attached. It's not a CD. That's just a standard savings account rate. Uh, when I was a kid, when interest rates were insane, the rate was five, five and a half percent. Uh, you know, you might be able to get close to six if you were in a credit union or or whatever. And that's that's a nice byproduct of these higher interest rates as you get better savings rates. But you can get fooled into being happy with that rate. But the market itself, if you're in a let's just say you're in a standard and poor's 500 index fund, over the course of time, that tends to average 10, 11 percent. 
No comparison. Yeah, would have done much better. Would have done much, much better. Now, it's still good for those upcoming expenses. So if you have something that's in the near future that you're going to have to spend money on, a place to park it that's going to keep better pace. It's not going to keep pace, but it's going to keep better pace with inflation that's better than it just been in a coffee can. So from that standpoint, we do appreciate the higher risk-free rate of return that's available right now. It still dropped a little bit from last fall, uh, but it's still a higher risk-free rate of return that most of us are accustomed to. But we do have to remember when you compare it to what the overall inflation rate has been, not for the moment or for a week, but you know, for a trailing one year or two years, when you compare it to that and you compare it to the performance of the stock market, you are losing value. However, it, it is a little bit more comforting, and I would fully re- admit that it is more comforting to look at it and say, well, look, I put 100000 in there, and I got a $4,000 return or a $5,000 return over the course of the year. But if it's there as an investment, if you're saying, hey, this is my 401K or, or a non-qualified account that I intend on using in retirement and it's got long-term goals, and you then you look at it over the course of this last quarter or, the, or 2023 altogether, then it kind of makes you feel a little bad. It's like, yeah, shoot, look how much money I missed out on simply because I was attracted to that risk-free rate of return. Phil, the market uh, has a lot of uh, uh, high beta factor. The, we're seeing a lot of movement in the markets, both up and down. The trend has been more up. I'm looking. I'm curious about the longer term picture. Uh, over the last couple, several years, we've had quite this vacillation has been embedded in a trend that's going up and up. What factors, and we have a decent sense of uh, this uh, short-term vacillation, uh, what factors will have us reverse course and the long-term trend been negative as opposed to positive? It's been a while since we've seen a long-term trend, if you really look back. And even, you know, we all have that memory of 2008, 2009, and we have the early 2000s. Of, of our market falls, but even those in comparison to the bull markets are short-term falls. And I'm going to point to one with COVID. I can't really think of anything that could have happened that would damage our markets more than COVID. If you really look at the 20 in March and April and May of 2020, when we sent everyone home and said you can't work, so now we don't have a strong consumer and there's supply issues. And at one point, our markets fell, or S&P fell over 40% in like a five-week time span. And by the end of the year, we regained it. And the reason that we've been able to do that is because of companies still finding a way to make money. So to look at something, what could cause us to uh, have a long-term uh, downfall, and that would be a weak consumer. That would be a consumer that's not willing to spend because a strong consumer, of course, leads to corporate profits, and corporate profits lead to what we're seeing in the markets. So if you're asking me what I think could happen that would cause a long uh, a long downturn, the, the number one answer would be a weaker consumer that, that doesn't that has legs and isn't able to recover and isn't able to recover by way of reduced interest rates and, and economic stimulus like we got in 2020. But those uh, pol- uh, political, whether it's coming from the Federal Reserve or the executive branch, those actions have been able to keep our uh, consumers strong. So if we look back a pivotal point, I think, a pivotal point during all of those is if we didn't respond to uh, to economic stimulus by way of cutting rates and 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 selling and or buying bonds back and and of course uh, uh, consumer stimulus by by way of uh, paycheck protection plan and, and all that if we didn't respond to that that could cause a long term downtrend. I was really surprised. It was at the home show over the weekend, and I interviewed a, a banker who told me that they have a product for uh, new first-time home buyers. It's a hundred percent financing for first-time home buyers, as long as they have a credit score. I think it was six six forty credit score, and. I, I literally was sort of, I, I couldn't think of a question to ask because I went right back to 2008 and all of the uh, over-leveraged real estate that, that was out there. 
if if there's a lot of hundred percent financed houses for new home buyers, is 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 that a source of concern for you? Yeah, if there's a ton of it, it would be. And then you know the underlier of that is is their ability to pay that loan back. So what is the debt to income that that mortgage company is looking at? Well, what's the risk of really, walking away? For, from someone walking away from it, it's fairly high, of course. But if you have, and that's what I was getting at, is if you have the capacity to handle the payment, if they look at someone, a husband and wife or, 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 or what have you, and say, hey, they have the capacity to make the debt service on this, and their credit tells us that they're likely to do it. Of course, there's less risk. And I'll give you another story that's a little, and it, it's close to home that's a little bit more bizarre. Now, I was smart enough not to do this, so keep that in mind. But my wife and I, we, we built our first home, and it was in 1999 when we started that process. And before they would start building it, we had to have a pre-approval letter. So we got a pre-approval. Now, this is we were fresh out of college, both of us. And between us both, we didn't have a year's worth of work experience, and neither of us had any credit that was above $300 credit card. That was the extent of what we had. So I was concerned, being in the field of my education that I am, I was concerned that we're never going to get approved for a loan. We're going to have to have one of our parents help us. We got pre-approved for a $400,000 mortgage, and the only thing that we had ever proven that we could pay back was a $300 credit card. And our only work experience didn't even extend past. I think she had been working for about six months, and I had a, a legitimate job for about three months. And that's what we were pre-approved for. So that type of lending opposed to, oh, 100% financing. Now, what's underneath of that 100% financing, I, I don't know. I can't speak to it. How strong does their debt-to-income have to be and so forth? But there was no way that we could have uh, afforded that. There's no way possible. And we were too naive to know – whether or not we could have, I just knew because of my education, this ain't right. We can't afford this. So a little bit of cheapness in, in the both of us protected us from going out and getting a mortgage like that. We bought a house for 112000 instead. But had we done that $400,000 mortgage, we probably would have been part of those people. It's like, hey, we can't pay for this, uh, not 23, 24 years ago. Come get this house. And that was where that real estate bubble existed. Now, like you said, that yeah, 100% financing is is a bit concerning. But what is underneath of that? Do they have strong credit, and do they have debt to income that would support that uh, that debt service payment? Part of your concern, John, is probably also remembering, and you, you didn't mention this part. Not only the 100% financing, but there were mortgages being written that were no principal payment mortgages. It was interest-only payments. Interest-only payments, yes. And, th and this was uh, capitalizing on the fact that home appreciation was skyrocketing. So, hey, you know what? No big deal. You Two years, you pay your interest, you get that deduction, and then you sell the house, and you've made $100,000. Well, you know, obviously, that caught up to a lot of people. And, Phil, your intelligence of not taking a $400,000 loan can't salute that enough because a lot of people – did take those loans 20, uh, 12, 15 years ago, and they couldn't afford them, but they were told that they qualified for it. So, yeah, sure, let's take as much house as we can get. And if you're a new homeowner, you really don't know. You have no you clue how you this math no works idea. out, right? No, you have no idea. And all the expenses that come with the home, you know, so as a first-time homebuyer, this is to John's point, here's where it's scary. I remember getting our first electric bill because it was always included in all my rent, and it scared me. I was like, oh, my gosh, look at the size of this. Oh, look at the phone bill. And it had all these other bills that really because we were children and we were naive, we were, and, of course, we could pay for it. But it was all expenses that we hadn't added up. We were just looking at that mortgage. How much is that mortgage going to be, and can we handle that? And we placed that, like, can we handle it on how much rent we were paying between the both of us? She was paying rent, and I was paying rent. We said, hey, look, our mortgage is going to be about what our rent is. What we didn't take into consideration was that we also had our electric and our water and our sewer and our phone all was already included, our trash. It was all already included in our rent. And, oh, Phil, you got to go buy some yard equipment, and you got to do this. All of those things that we, we left a cushion for, and it, that, that made it work. But first-time home buyers are sometimes very naive. So, and, and I agree with John; that is concerning because there should be some skin in the game, if you will, to ensure that they stay there. And you know, you never know. You get lawnmowers break, Phil. 
Yeah, you got to replace these <laughs> yes, things. Yes, they do, especially in the McCoy household. They break every <laughs> every change of season. Hey, how do we uh, get in touch with Phil McCoy and John Everson today? You can reach us at 304-263-4343 or stop by and see us with an appointment at 1271 Chester Avenue right here in Martinsburg. Thank you, Phil. Have a great day. Enjoy the eclipse. Thank you. You guys do the same.